Howdy, my name is Chris Edgington. I used to be terribly addicted to pornography and to lying. I want to tell you my story tonight, hopefully to encourage you that there is a way out of whatever your struggle is today. I need to start by telling you some things that happened to me when I was a little boy uh, so that you can understand, maybe you can relate. Um, all of these things happened um, uh, about the same time in, in my childhood. And in fact, one other thing that I want to say, um, uh, in telling these stories, in, in no way am I wanting to imply that, that my parents um, uh, somehow did a bad job or, or didn't uh, fulfill their role as my parents. I really do believe uh, that my parents did the best they could at, the, at this time uh, with the tools that they had um, they both came from broken families with uh, their own patterns of sin. And so um, uh, all the things that I'm going to talk about, some of which involved my parents, um, all of them have been completely forgiven. I can say with total sincerity that anytime I see my mom and dad, I, uh, I love them. I'm anxious to hug them, tell them I love them. And, uh, and so if you, if you saw us together, you would see that. Uh, but you need to know about some things that happened to me. In fifth grade, one example, uh, I loved playing music, and, uh, and I loved learning new, new musical instruments. And the school I was at um, started offering violin lessons, but you had to go to violin lessons at the same time that everybody else went to Rolling Chapel. Well, the teacher that I had, who happened to be a man, when it was time this particular day for Rolling Chapel, had everybody line up against the wall, and I did just what I thought I was supposed to do. I, instead of going in the line, I went to my locker, and I grabbed my violin, and he screamed at me in front of all the other kids, and he said, Edgington, what are you doing? And I said, because I, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong, I just said, I'm, I'm getting my violin to go to lessons, and he he looked at me uh, just in a way that, that really felt terrible. He said, you wuss, violin is for girls. And I was, I was just, I was crushed for multiple reasons. And uh, I remember I threw my violin in the locker, slammed it shut, and I left the school. I ran home. I lived, I think we lived probably four or five blocks from the school, and I, I ran home. I don't remember much else from that day or even the days following, but that was a, uh, a just a, uh, a pivotal day in, in my life. And then in seventh grade, I had some pretty bad experiences. I, I had been born with a birth defect that made uh, the left side of my chest, uh, especially when I was a skinny little boy, uh, probably didn't weigh more than 60 pounds soaking wet, uh, it made it look like I, I had a very enlarged breast. Uh, my parents had taken me to the to actually to Riley Hospital uh, when I was younger and had had me tested and and had different things done and they determined that it was benign. There wasn't really any. It, it was just extra tissue, and so they decided not to do anything about it. But in seventh grade, uh, being in the midst of uh, being forced to play shirts and skins basketball, I was repeatedly bullied and teased. Uh, I remember there were two particular boys that just seemed to gravitate towards me and they would call me half boy, half girl, and, and just all kinds of very, very mean things. And uh, I remember talking to my parents and my parents uh, uh, tried to talk to the school and, and I remember even sheepishly asking the gym teacher if I could be on the shirts team, but it seemed like he purposely always would put me on the skins team. And uh, some of that teasing would continue outside of gym class. Um, during that same time frame of fifth to seventh grade, I was being sexually abused by someone outside of my family. Unfortunately, uh, the, where we lived in that, that decade, it's, this was the early 80s, uh, nobody talked about that kind of stuff. And the part of town that I was in, uh, adults uh, were regularly exposing children to pornography and to inappropriate things. I remember the house just next door to us 
it was a regular thing to go into that house as a group of kids and and to see pornography on the TV and for for no, for it not to be shut off uh, for jokes to be made about it and uh, this was a common thing uh, f- for me as I was growing up the result of those things and probably others but those are the things that that were burned into my brain uh, from that time period was that I was a very confused and wounded teenage boy. And it was during that season of my life that my two addictions began. In seventh grade, I discovered a stash of pornography and I stole it and hid it in my bedroom. And uh, it, it, it turned out that looking at those magazines became my way of escaping into a world where the girls were pretty and nobody made fun of me. And uh, so at 13 years old, I, I was hooked. This is also when my other addiction took root because I would do anything to get to my room. I would uh, uh, say anything. I became addicted to lying just so I could go look at the magazines. I made up stories about being sick. I was on the cross country team and I would make up stories about practice being canceled for this reason or that reason. And I'm sure plenty of other things. Um, And so uh, that's when my addictions began. And um, they they continued in various ways uh, through high school and college. In the middle of high school, um, I went to a church camp, um, got saved and was baptized. Uh, One of the pastors from our church, a guy that I hadn't really paid attention to much, uh, I remember him talking at church camp that year. Uh, about walking and praying, and he talked about Jesus in a way that it just seemed like he knew him like a best friend. And all week, I couldn't wait to hear him talk about this relationship that he had with Jesus. And I don't remember the specifics of his messages, couldn't tell you the titles or anything that he quoted, but what I do remember is I wanted what that guy had. And uh, that's when I was first... Uh, That's my first recollection of making a decision to follow Jesus Christ. The rest of high school and college was a lot of struggling with these two addictions and never really finding freedom. I was involved in the church youth group, but I I don't remember anybody ever talking about addiction or pornography or or lying or sin or anything like that. Youth group back then, what I remember was just a, a... A bunch of adults that cared, that tried to uh, find a lot of fun things for us to do. Took us to concerts, took us to hay rides and cookouts. Um, At some point during those years, my dad found the magazines that I'd hid, and those were destroyed, and I found other ways to escape. Uh, Not all of them were sinful, but they were still rooted in the thing that really was driving me, and that was I wanted to escape from my life. I discovered computers. Uh, My dad bought me a computer and I would go to the library and read every single magazine and computer book they had. I would spend almost every waking moment trying to learn more about the computer and how to program. But my sin kept finding its way out. My lying continued. Um, I was always either hiding the truth about myself or exaggerating the truth to try to get attention. The senior year, my senior year of high school, I fell in love with the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. Um, we dated for a few years through the finish of high school and, and uh, college, uh, but my unresolved addictions continued to impact my life. Um, even though I finished high school well, I got a full ride scholarship to become a, a doctor. I was going to be an emergency room surgeon, but Um, Within that first year of college, it was clear that I could not manage my life. I I white-knuckled it through the first semester and got on the dean's list, but it went downhill from there. I would end up staying late, playing, staying up late, playing video games or watching uh, things I shouldn't have been watching on TV, not doing my work or not going to class. When there were tests, I would not go. And then I would make up some story with a professor, find out what the questions were from other people, always scheming to try to find a way to beat the system. Eventually, it unraveled, and I was caught in one of my lies by a professor. 
um, ended up flunking that class and uh, uh, not doing well at all that second semester of my freshman year. Um, things did not improve when I went back for my sophomore second year of college. I was cheating in multiple classes or at least attempting to and uh, continued to build on my obsession with computers. Eventually, I wrote a letter to my parents telling them about my lies and about how much I hated my life um, and that I didn't want to stay at that college anymore. I ended up transferring to Purdue and uh, studying computer science, uh, but that didn't last either. And I ended up dropping out, getting a job in Kokomo, and uh, getting married. Then, uh, 91, 92 time frame, uh, the newness and excitement of adulthood kept my addictions at bay for a while. I had a new job, a new place to live, a new wife, uh, started a company with a friend of mine making computer graphics, uh, wrote some software. I thought life was good. Um, the addictions would come and go in various ways, but I was always good at hiding and covering up so that nobody knew. Lots of things changed over the next three to four years. I got another new job. I moved to New Hampshire, my wife and I. Uh, we ended up joining a church uh, out there, got back into music, playing the keyboard at the church. But the truth is the same patterns uh, emerged as before. I got obsessed with my job, worked crazy hours. Sometimes I had weeks where I would work 100 plus hours, left my wife very lonely, and uh, eventually we ended up moving back to Indiana and bought a house in Peru. Once we were settled in Peru, all was going good, uh, at least so I thought. The sinful patterns that I had, the addictions were managed or in some cases justified in my mind. Uh, I was married, serving part-time as a youth pastor and working this great high-tech job from home. Uh, my addictions had been managed over the years, but I'd really never done the work necessary to break free from them until the day or the week that everything caught up with me. I had this project that my boss and I had estimated to take uh, about six to eight weeks, uh, but because I tended to think that I was smarter than everybody else, I thought I could breeze through it in four weeks. Over the next four weeks, or over the next two weeks, I lied about the progress that I was making. Um, so, uh, at the beginning of the project, instead of working, I was goofing off. I worked from home, but I wasn't very disciplined. Spent a lot of time playing video games and frisbee golf. My wife had a part-time job, uh, in Peru, and, and so she was gone, so she did not know that I was doing all of this. Well, two weeks into the project, my boss called and said, hey, IBM wants a demo of the work that you've been doing for the for these last two weeks and and I freaked out. I spent the next three days working nonstop, lying to everybody about why I was doing it and told them that I'd got asked to work on something super urgent, that I couldn't be distracted. Friday morning that week, my pastor calls around eight o'clock in the morning and I had gone to bed around three or four uh, because of the uh, urgent work uh, to try to rescue the project that I'd been lying about. So I was still asleep, and when I answered, he said, hey, did I wake you up? I did my best. I've been awake for hours voice and said no, and then we finished the conversation. The truth is, the rest of the day, I was overwhelmed with the weight of my sin. I couldn't rescue the project from my goofing off, and uh, I just lied to my pastor, and I was the youth pastor. It felt like my world was crumbling, and I seriously, throughout that day, I remember considering multiple times just getting in my car and, and driving. I don't even know where I was going to drive, but I just wanted to leave. I, there, were, there were multiple times where I thought that was going to fix it. Um, but eventually, Friday night, I went for a walk and had one of the most real, honest conversations that I'd ever had with Jesus. I told him everything. I told him that I wanted to be free from all of it and that I was willing to do whatever I had to to be free and that I would accept whatever the consequences were. I came home. I slept really well that night. Then Saturday, I wrote um, three letters, one to my work, one to my wife, and one to my pastor. And 
In all of them, I confessed it all. I didn't leave anything unsaid. There were no secrets left. And in each one, I, I said that I would understand uh, and accept whatever the consequences were, that I knew it would be difficult to trust me anymore. Saturday night, had another long prayer walk, continuing to surrender this and say, Lord, I trust you. I'm giving this to you. And I, and I remember just being at, incre- at, at, at peace, an incredible peace, unexplainable peace, the kind of peace that it talks about in Philippians chapter 4. Um, I had imagined the worst consequences that could happen from all of these letters, and I was fine with all of them. Sunday morning, I left the letter for my wife. Honestly, I could not face her. I was ashamed. I went to the church, read the letter to my pastor. Uh, Monday morning, sent the email to work. Um, Got a call from my boss about three hours after sending. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what happened? I mean, what happened with your wife? What happened with your pastor? What happened with work? Um, Well, got to be honest, nothing that I expected. And and I want to stop right here and tell you that one of the number one tricks of the enemy is to convince you that confession and coming clean is going to be the absolute worst thing you could ever do. He, he will convince you that that, that, is going, that is going to be terrible. The truth is, um, it was nothing like what I expected. Work, they didn't fire me. They did require me to finish the project which unfortunately ended up being a four-month project instead of a two-month project, and I didn't get paid for any of the extra work. My wife, she forgave me quickly, and honestly, I don't ever remember her mentioning it again. Uh, My pastor, he did something that I had never experienced in my life. He took my letter after I read it to him, and included in the letter I said um, something... uh, along the lines of, I'm willing to read this letter to the congregation and submit my resignation today. In my mind, I thought, how in the world uh, could they continue to have me as a youth pastor after confessing all of these things? And um, he read it, and I remember him looking at me, and he folded it up like this, very slowly. I was crying. Um, He folded it up like this, and he handed it back to me. And he said, honestly, Chris, I don't, think you need to, I don't think you need to read this to the church. It sounds like you've already started doing what you need to do. And if you're willing to do whatever I tell you to do, I'll help you figure out all these things. I don't remember the specifics of what he said, but basically he said, I'm, I'm going to help you. And uh, that uh, began an incredible Uh, season in my life. He came back uh, sometime in the next week with this crazy thing that he called the packet. (laughs) Uh, The the deepest, uh, most intense level of accountability I had ever experienced, and I've never seen anybody else do it. Um, I've offered this to some other people, and uh, and, uh, it's pretty hard to get people to be willing to sign up for this. Uh, but it was this report I had to fill out every single week, and I had to have it under his door on his desk by 8 o'clock every morning. I had to tell him. It was three pages long, and uh, I, had to, I had to answer questions like, how was your marriage this week on a scale of 1 to 10, and, and why? I had to uh, list uh, all of my devotional habits, um, what time I got up every day, how much sleep I was getting, um, what would you do different in ministry and in your personal life if you could have this week to do over? Um, what menial job have you done this week, or have you delegated all of them to your spouse or other people? Um, I had to rate my performance and character uh, ten uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being you did and acted like Jesus would, um, and, and I had to explain my answers. Uh, I had to uh, answer questions like list in extreme detail any way in which you were dishonest this week. Um, have you conducted yourself in any way this week that would be less than an example relating to your conversation and association with the opposite sex? How much TV have you watched in hours 
Was it programs that caused temptation or lust? At this stage of growth that you're in, what would you say are your three greatest weaknesses? Oh my gosh. Uh, I got to tell you folks, this stuff was crazy hard, but I was committed to it. The, the promise that I'd made to Jesus that night was real. I did not want to get in that situation again, and I wanted to change. And I did that for a year. I filled those reports out for a year. And uh, they developed in me the process of confessing and writing these things down to him. And some of the things that I wrote, I honestly expected him to call me and say, wow, wasn't expecting you to write that. We've got to talk. Um, it never happened. <laughs> it never happened. Um, and, and so I learned uh, that there is uh, freedom and, and healing to be found. And the truth is, James 5.16 says it. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another and you shall be healed. And that developed in me a pattern of confession that continues to this day. The truth is, I no longer struggle. <laughs> well, I cannot explain how he did it. It's a mystery. Going through this process of excavation and or exploration through my heart, the Lord changed my want-tos. He changed my desires. I, I, I'm no longer the guy that I used to be. I no longer want to hide. I no longer want to escape. Now, that doesn't mean I live a perfect life. The enemy still tempts me. Uh, especially when I'm tired, when I haven't been getting the kind of sleep that I need, when I'm, those are my weakest times, but that's coming from outside of me now. That's the enemy dangling something in front of me. It's no longer coming from roots that are buried deep in my heart. The times that I do give into temptation, I confess, and healing happens every single time. Hebrews 12 is one of my favorite passages in, in the Bible. Uh, and it talks about Hebrews 12:11 specifically says no discipline seems pleasant no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful but later on it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who endure it and i got to tell you that season of discipline and the years following i mean i i didn't stop growing at the end of that year even though i stopped these reports i continued having lots of things excavated from my heart and dealt with that were a part of the healing process for me. Um, but the discipline of doing that was worth it. Now, I just turned 50 this past year, and, and so this all was happening 25 years ago, and now I'm experiencing the harvest of righteousness and peace. Uh, and I'm not talking about a holier-than-thou kind of thing, like I'm better than others, but a, a sincere level of peace and rest that comes from knowing you ain't got any secrets, not hiding anything. Uh, your, your desires are to honor God in all that you do. I need to also say to you that when you decide to come clean, come all the way clean. Once you've confessed it all and you've got no more secrets, you're literally taking the ammunition out of the enemy's gun because he walks around convincing you that people are going to find out about your secrets, that they're going to they're going to find out that you've been drinking again, that you've been using again, that you've been lying again, you've been gambling again, whatever it is for you. And and so he teases you with that and then you hide more, you manipulate more. But when you've confessed it all, when you've come clean and you keep that pattern in your life, there's nothing else the enemy can accuse you with. You, he can say, hey, what if they find out about this? You can look at him and say, they already know. <laughs> now, for me, it's been decades since I've sought out pornography or told a lie that I didn't confess. And I'm telling you that tonight to say that living in freedom and victory with no more fear, it's attainable. I have no more secrets. Now my wife and I lead an outreach to teenagers in our community focused on helping them find their way to Jesus. I also coach cross country at our local high school. My life today is nothing like what it could have been. It's a thousand times better because of Jesus. <laughs> I don't know what your struggle is today, but I do know that he is waiting for you to turn your life over to him. 
to open all the doors, open all the windows, let him into every single corner of your heart. I know that you can find the same mercy, grace, freedom, and victory that he has brought to me. I want to close with a passage from Zephaniah. In my Bible, it's titled Restoration, and it says this, Zephaniah 3, 14 through 17, Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hangs, hands hang limp. The Lord, your God, is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice over you with singing. Take care.